As we prepare this event, we've uh, invited six countries uh, participants. First of all, in session one, we are going to focus on the topic called people, human exchange and health cooperation between Korea and Mekong. And I would like to invite Pantabong Keopilabi for the session moderator. Mr. Pantabong? Yes, uh, good morning, ready and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, uh, I have the great honor to, to be the moderator for this important meeting. Uh, for for the, the session one, we, we have uh, the people and human exchange and health cooperation. In this session, we have the three topics. or present uh, presenters. Uh, the first presenter is uh, the doctor, uh, Brick Yong Han, is an assistant professor of Department of Vietnamese Studies School of ASEAN and Middle Eastern Studies. Then Cook University, South Korea, his field of study in to rest in East Cooperative Sociology, Social Capital, Health and Welfare. The Mekong and Vietnamese study, he published a number of books and articles in the field of the sociology and the Vietnamese study. Uh, today, he will present the topic is the Mekong ROK cooperation and the migration and development nexus. Peace, the doctor. Good morning, my name is Baek Yong-hun. First, I would like to share my screen. Thank you very much for inviting me and giving me an opportunity despite the COVID-19 and restriction of a participation of this event. And I am grateful to meet all of you online. And once again, thank you very much for those who prepare this event and make this event wonderful. As introduced, my topic today is the Mekong ROK Corporation and the Migration and Development Nexus. I'm usually studying in Vietnamese studies and in a broader Mekong affairs. So today I want to focus on topic called migration and the status and this will be more like information for you uh, this is my research paper published last may called the mekong rok corporation and the migration and development nexus focusing on development human developing human resources this is my table of contents first i would like to introduce the background of my study and the overview of this study, followed by statistics, discussion, conclusion, and the policy implications. This is the background of my study. As mentioned in keynote speech, in November 2019, we had the very first Mekong ROK summit on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of ASEAN ROK diplomatic tie. And here we discuss the people who directly are affected by the immigration migration. And one of the topics was to enhance the cooperation to advance human resources development by promoting vocational education and training and education cooperation. Among ASEAN countries, the population from Mekong region in South Korea is 
further increasing and all the five countries are under the subject of the work permit allowance according to the korean war that's why the migration issue is very important and directly related to the mekong region countries and my study paid attention more details about the migration of these populations from mekong countries to south korea also as you can see here one of the objectives is to find ways to promote sustainable human exchange from the perspective of circular migration. This diagram is a summary of the keynote speech. Under the big frame uh, work of the uh, Mekong ROK Corporation, you can have more in details. In 2014, we have a special summit between Mekong, ROK, and we adopted action plan. And as you can see at the top, we have issues of a political security cooperation, economic cooperation, social cultural cooperation, connectivity, cooperation in the region, regional and international affairs, initiative for ASEAN integration and sub-region cooperation. A total of seven were discussed. Among these areas, connectivity and initiative for ASEAN integration and narrowing development gaps and sub-region cooperation were highlighted by the Korean government with uh, further actions and measures. In 2011, we had a Han River Declaration in 2011. Accordingly, we also adopted the plan of actions since 2014, and we selected six priority areas of cooperation. And on top of that, based on the new Southern policy of the Republic of Korea, we added more priority agendas and areas, as you can see. And now we have a seven new priority areas for the cooperation between the two parties. In particular, for human resources development, in 2014 and onwards, this has include this has been included as a new priority area and in 2019 Han River Mekong declaration we discussed the people for inclusive society and we had a clear vision and goals regarding human resources development next is a review of my study this is based on the uh, existing studies on migration, focusing on optimism and pessimism. By adopting various theories that were popular in different times, you can see the flow of the studies. In two, before 1970s, uh, we adopted a modernization theory. In this context, migration was more was viewed as optimistic and after that we had a world system theory dependency theory in 1980s and in 1990s we talked about a deficient effectiveness advanced donors experienced the uh, deteriorated economy and that affected a new neoliberal discourse in that time. Uh, therefore, that's when we started to think this ODA activities were more viewed like individually, not at the national level. And labor, women, and other development issues have been diversified since 1990s. When we entered to, in 2000s, we adopted the transnationalism and especially there have been some issues including some transaction of uh, money transfer of the migrants and that which could affect some economic development of different countries and it returned back to optimism. In 2000, in 2000, especially in mid 2000s, 
the immigration could be maximizing the benefits from the departing countries and that was what people believe since mid 2000s and this is also when we started to talk about the concept called circular migration when we say circular it means that you go back to your home country and sometimes you migrate again from your home country and this has been viewed in terms of a human development in perspective of a human development so depending on individuals and the countries where immigrants depart from and arrive in uh, are the topics that we've been focusing on and paying attention to. Next, I would like to show you some statistics. This is a statistics based on the trend of the immigration between ROK and the Mekong countries. And I have a various aspects of statistics. If you look at this table, 90 days is the standard. And before 90 days, if it's in less than 90 days, it's a short term stay. And if it's over 90 days, it's regarded as a long term stay in South Korea. You can see some tourist visa, simple visiting uh, unless, in less than 90 days. And if it's a longer term, probably it's for workers and marriage migrants and the foreign study, foreign students. We'll go through each and every element of these statistics. This shows the Korean visitors to Mekong countries. In 2015, we had about 3.1 million people, and as of 2019, it has been 6.7 million, which almost doubled. Cambodia's figure reduced uh, as per Laos, staggered a bit. In Myanmar, we have a doubled figure. We have a little bit of increase for Thai people. Uh, the figure of uh, Vietnamese visiting Korea became fourfold. So since 2016, we've added a million each year. This table shows the Mekong visitors to South Korea. By 2015, we marked, we witnessed a fivefold of sorry, twofold by 2019. A lot of Vietnamese, as you can see. Next table shows the number of foreign residents from, especially from five Mekong countries. In 2021, uh, I, pull, I was managed to pull out very recent statistics and a total of 453,000 foreign residents in Korea. By nine, 2019, we have had increased numbers, although in 2000, between 2019 and 2021, we had a slightly decreased number due to COVID-19. Of course, Vietnam marked number one, followed by Thailand. And if you compare the figure in 2015, in 2006 and onward, the Thai people show the greatest number uh, to, resi to reside in South Korea. Among this number of uh, foreign residents, I break it down in short-term and long-term residents. Among short-term residents, the population of uh, Mekong nationals we have the biggest number from Thailand, in, uh, followed by Vietnam, especially in 2018 and 2019, we've had some increase around, at around 50,000 people from each country. This shows number of foreign residents depending on the type of visas. First of all, short-term visas can break can be break it down based on 19 days of uh, stay without declaration of the purpose of your visit 
these people usually just stay and this is highly related to visa in early 1980s singapore malaysia thailand and brunei were the four countries who signed for visa exemption with korea and later thailand was added and that is why we had a higher figure from thailand vietnam and other countries have different figures as you can see here especially for short-term visiting visa we have some numbers coming into south korea in the short term next one shows the longer term of the same number of foreign residents as mentioned these people are workers migrant wives and foreign studies uh, for foreign students and as of march 2021 we've had 273,000 uh, foreign residents and a slight decrease due to covid among all these five vietnam has the biggest number and this number of vietnam alone is almost double with the number combined with all these four other mekong countries and this shows the number of foreign workers we have skilled workers and unskilled or simple workers as of march 2021 we have about over 3000 skilled workers and unskilled is about 113,000. Of course, the Vietnamese population is the biggest. Cambodia and Laos have a similar number of unskilled people. And this is uh, more in detail, break it down of the number of foreign workers. We have professors, foreign language instructors, and researchers in Vietnam, from Vietnam, for example, we have the biggest number from specially designated activities or E7 visa. And we also have some researchers and professors from Vietnam coming into Korea. These are designated by the Minister of Justice of the Republic of Korea. And this is a very special visa issued to uh, specific workers and that includes engineers and maybe workers in transportation and some skilled workers these are the people who can get this type of visa next one is unskilled or simple workers uh, we have a visa of non-professional employment vessel crew and employment as of end of april 2021 vietnam and cambodia shows the highest numbers in cambodia from cambodia for example they had the biggest number in non-professional employee from vietnam we mainly have people for non-professional employment and vessel crew next one is about a migrant marriage immigrants they achieved this visa due to their marriage after 2005 we had a soaring number from vietnam as of april 2021 we have about 40,000 vietnamese marriage immigrants coming into korea and that's the biggest number from mekong countries and followed by other countries like cambodia and thailand Regardless of COVID, other countries have sent us a similar number of immigrants unless Vietnam it has been uh, it has been staggered. The number has been staggered. Next one is the number of the foreign studies, foreign students. And we have some overseas students, Korean language trainees and uh, foreign language trainees. We were not able to find all the figures as of April 2021, but as you can see, obviously it is Vietnam that shows the highest number. And these are the number of overseas Koreans in the five Mekong region countries. And we have about 172,000 in Vietnam, of course, is the biggest number, followed by Thailand and Cambodia. 
So all based on all these statistics, I want to highlight that Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia have more numbers, but overall, if you think of this Mekong region, we have about 20 foreigners uh, residing and living in South Korea, which is the which is quite a big number. And in terms of the circular immigration, uh, we need to utilize this in a positive and optimistic manner. So it's important to do the capability building of human resources and uh, listen to some demands from these Mekong countries. And that's the discussion I want to I want to bring up and uh, that was also brought up in my research paper. You can just refer to the age structure and various indicators in terms of human resources, as you see on the screen. And we have some contents related to human resources development in the five Mekong countries. And you can see the various details. And these are subject to individual countries. My last part covers conclusion and policy implications. As you saw in Korea Mekong Corporation, human, research, human resources development is based on the understanding of human resources development sector and in the perspective of a circular migration. If you think of the inclusive society, there should be diversity. And in the course of development, there shouldn't be anybody neglected or excluded. And we should uh, review any possible uh, bipolarization and some development gaps. So if you think about the human resources development, each stakeholder and individual should speak up for their opinion, for his or her opinions. And when they fully realize their capability and potentials, we are able to realize the people and the inclusive uh, people in inclusive society. There are people immigrating into Korea from Mekong countries and in order to properly handle them we can also think of some measures that they can contribute to the development of the Korean society. Regarding human resources development in the perspective of a Korea Mekong corporation We've had some implementation and measures, and that was uh, what my study touched upon. It's also important to reinforce mutual responsibility between sending and receiving countries. And once they return to their home countries, they should be also included and should not be excluded from their original society. And these are some considerations to help them when they return. That wraps up my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Derek Young uh, for all the, your presentation. Um, it's very useful information to let us to understand the uh, status of the human exchange between the Mekong and RK, and also to find a way to promote the sustainable human exchange from the perspective of circular migrations. So uh, before we move to the second topic, we might uh, open the floor to uh, have the Q&A. Uh, but we have to keep in time, right? Uh, maybe in five minutes before we move to second. Uh, if you have any uh, question, you can open the floor for you. Please. If, are there any questions? 
if if you don't have question, maybe in order to keep the time, so maybe we move to uh, the second topics, uh, which were presented by uh, Professor uh, Siva Siva Kun Mala Malakun is the the farm former research assistant at the Institute of Thai Studies, Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok, Thailand. He is uh, interest in the media and information technology. He holds a Institute of the Thai Study Research the Media. Tents and cultural tourists in Thailand. And another uh, presenter is the Professor Pam Solamut, a deputy director of, is in research of Institute of Thai Study, Chulalongkorn University. Uh, is it also the part of ongoing project of the Institute of Thailand Study in a cooperation with the Ministry of Cultural Thailand to promote the sustainable toilet in the northern region in Thailand. Uh, they will present a topic on the Thailand, Korea tourism before and after pandemics. Please, uh, you have your floor. Please, your floor. Yeah. Actually, the main presenter will be Khun Sivakorn Malakun Ayutthaya, but I will stay here for uh, the last session if there are any questions or, an, or, the, or anything else. Have. So please welcome our, uh, our, 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 our one of our best uh, listeners fellowship, have the former Mr. Fellowship, have Mr. Siwakorn Malakun Na Ayutthaya. Yes, hello. Is You should be well. Thank you. Now let me begin my presentation. I'd like to speak in English. Hello everyone, I'm Siwakon Malagun. Today I'm the representative of the Institute of Thai Study, Jurangkorn University. Um, this presentation in associate with the Professor Prem Swan Samud, uh, the deputy director of the Institute of Thai Study, Jurangkorn University. And for this presentation in the topics of the um, Thailand and Korea tourism before and after the pandemics, Okay, um, let's move to the um, outline of these presentations. I have three main parts of this presentation. First is Thailand and Korea tourism make change. The second one is Thailand and Korea tourism promotion activities. And the third one is traveling after the COVID-19. Okay, yeah. so the first topic is Thailand and Korea tourism make change. And the jingle of this um, part is how often we have been meet up so far um, in, since the before the COVID-19 and during the COVID and after COVID. Okay, um, before I talk about the statistic information, in briefly, between Thailand and Korea, we have strong diplomatic relationships more than 63 years and so on and continuously. Um, so um, because of the strong relationships, um, um, before the COVID-19 pandemic, both Thailand and Korea, we have the agreement for free short-term visa for 90 days at the presentation of uh, Professor Pek, uh, Pek Yong, Pek Yong Hun, yes, as the, the presentation before. So during the COVID-19, um, they have some um, policy to restrict the the um, the spread of the pandemic. So. This day we don't have any agreements, but after the COVID-19, I hope that we're gonna have the agreement continuously. And the first is um, I would like to to show about the world tourism statistics in the 2019 before the COVID-19. Um, both Thailand and Korea um, continue growth of the tourism industry. Um, before the COVID-19, and I'm proudly that Thailand is the rank four of the to earn the tourism industry in the rank four, but you can see um, when the COVID-19 hit to our wall, um, 
the number of surveys around the world was also um, gone. And okay, oh, and the next next page is the the number of the Korean tourists who visit in Thailand. Um, is proudly that the Korean tourists rank in rank four, as the um the number of almost 1.9 million tourists and increasing every year with this graph you can see the the um the increasing of the number of korean tourism who is it in thailand um, um between 2006 to the 2019s um but you may wonder in the 2008 2009 and 2014 what's happening um uh, actually is we have the internal political protest in Thailand, and we also the coup by the, the military government. So, um, it is the factor for the the tourists around the world to to make a decision to visit to Thailand. Next is the bi monthly in three years before the, the COVID nineteen hit our world, and you can see in the January is the more. Um, the most number of Korean tourists who visit in, in Thailand uh, because of the weather of, of Thailand in the January is the cool season. And the, due to the, the global change and global warming, um, actually in the most every year, is uh, every month is also still hot. But in the April and May is the most uh, peak season, it's like hottest season of Thailand. So uh, the number of tourists also um, just a um, minimal. And this information I'm showing about the how much Koreans spend in terms of time and money. Um, you can see that um, the the time, the rent of stay for Korean tourists is surprisingly that they stay in Thailand um, about one week at the 7.0 days uh, with the non-group tour or individual tourists. Um, they stay um, around the x point three six um, days. That is that is quite long to to spending time in Thailand in my mind. And about the spending per day, they spend around one hundred and eighty US dollar per day. And let's figure out how much they spend and what what they spend for Korean tourists. Um, with this information, um, you can see uh, the most expense is in the uh, accommodations, food and beverage, and the entertainment. About the accommodations, um, for Korean tourists, they prefer to stay at the um, more than three-star hotels or boutique hotels or resort hotels. Um, um, that is different from the past that they, they stay in the guest house more than this kind of um, a business hotel or something like that. And also Korean tourists spend in the uh, entertainment uh, quite a lot also. And where Korean tourists go? And with this information is quite um, interesting for recently year that because um, you can see like in the 2018, um, the increasing number of the Korean tourists traveling in the minor traveling cities like in the Udon Thani, Chiang Rai, or Bajok Kiri Khan province, that is um, the, the uh, tourist authorities of Thailand figured out that kind of city as the minor traveling cities. But in the major traveling cities also popular for a lot of tourists and also for Koreans, um, like in the Bangkok or Chonburi or the, the Pattaya and the Phuket, Chiang Mai, Suratani or the uh, the Samui Island and the Krabi. This kind of um, province is the major traveling city that is popular and attract for tourists around the world also. And this information I will uh, break down that in the Bangkok cities where Korean tourists um, go and visit and enjoy. Okay, it's um, the most attraction place is the Khao San Rose that we know that is really, really famous for, for tourists. And also the Terminal 21, that is the department store where it's located nearby the um, Korean, or the, the Korea town in, in Bangkok. And the third one is the Gan Palace and coming up with the Chai Chai Market or Chadu Chak Weekend Market. 
And another stop is the restaurant and another tourist spot, the shopping center in Bangkok. And when we figure out about the activities for Korean tourists in Thailand, okay, uh, the top five activity for Korean tourists is the eating Thai food, doing Thai massage and spa, um, visiting the historical sightseeing place or the beach, or um, enjoy the nightlife. It is top five activity for Korean tourists. But another activity that um, right now the tourist authority of Thailand they are focusing on for new trend for Korean tourists is the golf because um, our, uh, some Korean people who love playing golf they also enjoy to playing golf in Thailand also and these kind of activities can earn a lot of uh, money for, for the government and for the tourism business. So that's why the tourism authority are focusing on. And I will um, talk about the activities, suggestion and program or plan later. But in the other, another ways about the, how much Thai tourists visit to, to Korea, um, it's, it's interesting that um, the destination for Thai tourists is to, to go to Korea in the rank five, and you can see uh, for the uh, for the outer of the ASEAN country is in the in the rank three, and in and also for the number of Thai tourists visit Korean is increasing every year, as you can see uh, from the presentation presentation of Professor Park before, and. Okay, let me talk about the expense of Thai tourists when they're traveling in, in Korea. About the rent of stay, uh, okay, um, the, the number of the day to stay in Korea a little bit shorter for of the, the Korean tourists in the number of the six day, around six day, and the spendings also a few than the Korean tourists spending in Thailand is it is the 165 US dollar per day. And about the spending of the, the Thai tourists when they traveling here in Korea, um, almost uh, spending is in the, the accommodations and the beverage. And for about the accommodation in Korea, um, because um, a lot of Thai tourists in, in Korea, they are a younger generation, so they prefer to stay in the guest house or sharing house, like in the Airbnb. So um, that is that is slightly different with the Korean tourists in Thailand. Okay, uh, I will move to the second part of my presentation. is about Thailand and Korea tourism promotion activities. Uh, with the jingle of the we will get to know each more each other when we visit each other homes. Um, in this part, I will talk in the level of the cooperation or the promotion. It is the first activity is in the government to government level or G to Gs. This activity is um, um, referred to the 60th anniversary of Thailand and Korea diplomatic relationships in cooperation between the Korea Association of Tourist Agents and the Tourist Tourism Authority of Thailand and the Association and the Association of Thai Travel Agents. This is the, um, the conference and business talk um, of the, the government and the, the Korean agencies. And in, from this conversation, they also have a, a, the idea to, to, to increase more the, the, the flight from Thailand to Korea, like in the, the minor traveling cities, because um, in Thailand, we just have only in from Bangkok, Chiang Mai and Phuket. And also we have the direct flight to Korea in the um, Incheon, in Seoul and Busan in Jeju Island. So if we increase more the flight, operate more flights, um, the number of tourists in outbound and inbound also increasing. That is the, the plan and expectations. Another activity is the, the government to business level. This is the Amazing Thailand Raxury Sale Meetings in 2019. On the point to attract high-end tr Korean travelers, this activity is um, organized by the Tourism Authority of Thailand and the in the Seoul office 
this activity is to um, kind of workshop and promote to the Korean travel agencies, the big company of the Korean agencies, to uh, promote Thailand quality destinations um, to expectly, expectly to high spending niche market, such as in the golfer, wedding and honeymoons and health and wellness. As I, I mentioned about the golfer, that's the number of the, the Korean who love golf, enjoy to, to traveling, to playing golf in Thailand. And also about wedding and honeymoons. Like in the past, a lot of Koreans, when they marry and they enjoy to honeymoon in Thailand. And also, we also would like to increase this kind of activities for Korean couples also, and about the health and, well and willingness that is also famous for Thai um, activities. And another activity is in the business to customer level. This is the exhibitions of the Thai International Travel Fairs or TITF. This is the big events of the promotion of traveling in the domestic and international. Um, this activity is organized by the Thai Travel Agency Association, copyright with the Tourism Authority of Thailand and Tour Agency, and also uh, from the um, airlines companies. Um, this kind of events also have the booth of the tourist, Korean Tourism Organization, or KTO, with this um, um, events also have providing the, the tourism attraction information and also selling the tickets of the air, air, air flight and also uh, the touring package and, and the hotel or something like that in this kind of event. So this kind of event is the biggest event in Thailand to promote the traveling around the world and within the country. And another activity is in the government to customer level, this is activity by the Korean Tourism Organization in the Thai, Thailand office. The activity called the Love Korea Fair 2020 um, in the Central World Department Store in Bangkok. This kind of activity is um, aimed to promote the cultural and the tourist spot and also the kind of some activity like K-pop dancing content or something like that. And also selling the trouble games and the air flight tickets by the uh, great the airlines companies in this event. This event is a yearly basis activity to promote to the customer directly, like in the offline platform. But I will talk about the online platform that is really influenced in this digital era so much in the customer to customer level that because this kind of digital media are, de are delivered to the, the audience directly and widely. So there are many vlogger, influencer or YouTuber that create the contents of traveling in Korea and also in Thailand, such as the vlog in Busan, in Seoul, or in Pankhok or in Chiang Rai. So this kind of the activities that is promote the tourism. So in the, the wrap up of about the, the activity of, and programs or package for Korean tourists in Thailand, um, as I present about the activity for Korean tourists, this activity is to group things in the four package and programs. The first program is focusing by the, the um, tourist authority of Thailand for the niche market or luxury tourism, like for golf, wellness and spa. And this is a kind of activity to increase and, and attract this, this sector of tourists. And another program is cultural and sustainable tourism that relate to the, um, the global sustainable tourism councils. This kind of programs are developing um, with the Institute of Thai Studies and the Ministry of Tourism and Sports. Uh, for the examples of the activities, be like enjoy the Thai foods in the learning and eating, um, visiting the historical sightseeing, local life learnings, natural sightseeing, the festival, Thai boxing, and also Thai massage. This is the activity to promote the, the local cultural and also the sustainable tourism also. In the next activities is about the adventure and camping. Um, that because I know that a lot of Korean people, they love to enjoy the, 
the adventure and camping. Like I can see when I'm here in Korea, I see a lot of Korean people enjoy about track, you do tracking or hiking. That's why Korean people are really, really healthy. So this kind of activity in Thailand is about the natural beach sightseeing and also the adventure of camping in the national park. And also in the southern part of Thailand, you can um, snuggling and scuba diving because in the southern part of Thailand, we have a really beautiful coral reef. And in the last activities is about the entertainment, entertainment activities for um, this kind of activities to promote for the younger generation, like in the millennium generation or Y generations, that because they still enjoy about their life. So the, the most interesting activities is, is about the night lights because in Thailand we also are really really famous for the full moon party or something like that and also we we can offer the program for the theme park and amusement park in, in Thailand and also about the shopping and duty free for the tourists that that a lot of Korean tourists also enjoy to um spending time in the Thai department store and the shopping complex also because in Thailand, um, in the one shopping com complex, they have many kind of activities and, and enjoy in the whole days. And the last part that I have to presentation for today is about the traveling after the COVID-19. And we are waiting to meet up soon. I know that a lot of Thai Thai tourists also waiting for visit in Korea again or once a time. And also I, I know that a lot of Korean people are also waiting for traveling around the world and also to visit in, in Thailand also. So when the COVID-19 hit our country and hit around the world, it's really, really crisis for us. With this information to show about the contributions of the travels and tourism to the GDP of Thailand, we can see almost 22% of the, the, the tourism business are um, related to the Thailand GDP. So um, that is really, really um, crisis when our country is locked down and we have no tourist visit to Thailand. By the information, can we can realize that it's really, really pain and crisis for Thai economics. Okay, and in this information by the United Nations of the World Tourism Organizations, um, from uh, they also have the expectations of the situation for world tourism, and they expect that. Um, in the 2000, 2024, the situation is going to be going back like in the past. And I also think that everything is going to be getting better after um, the people already have the vaccines. And when, they, when everyone can allow to traveling aboard and the, the tourism business is going to be getting better after that. And also here is the information of the plan of the Thai government to welcome back a vaccinated tourists. Um, they have the four stages of plan, uh, the welcome back. In the first stage, in the quarter to quarter two of this year, in the sandbox areas of the Phuket, Krabi, Panga, Samui, Chiang Mai and Pattaya, um, they have the plan for the, the, the tourists who already vaccined, or who already have the vaccines, um, they have to uh, quarantine for seven days. And in the second state, in the quarter of the year, in the Phuket, uh, Phuket, Phuket cities, um, no need to quarantine for the traveler who already vaccines. And in the third state, um, in the quarter, four of this year in the seventh area of, of the sandbox area I mentioned, um, no need to quarantine for, for the tourists who already vaccinated. And the fourth state um, in the January of next year, um, the all area of Thailand and all province, we're gonna be open for all tourists who already vaccinated and no need to quarantine. 
And okay, in the conclusion of this presentation, um, as I present about the statistic information for Korean tourists, um, Korean tourists are important to Thailand economy as Thailand rely on the tourism industry for over 20% of Thailand GDPs. So I hope that when the situation getting better, I hope that the Korean tourists gonna be visited to Thailand again and again. And also, I also um, present about the tourism promotion policy for Korean tourists in the Thailand, in the side of Thailand. First is about the, the creating the plan and program for sustainable tr tourism. And also the next one is the increasing information in the Korean language for traveler because as the number of the Korean tourists increasing every year and it's going to be better to provide the, the, the Korean language information for, for them also. And the third one is the cooperation of operation of the, the flight between Thailand and Korea um, from the minor traveling cities that because this kind of act, this kind of um, movements, also increasing the number of the Thailand tourists and Korean tourists also. And the last activity is about the organized the tour program for Korean tourists in the niche market. This is the, the kind of plan of the Thailand government. And also I have some suggestions for Korean tourism, like um, they can also focusing on the Thai niche market also because um, to increase more number of Thai tourists in this group is also the gap and also they have some um, some benefit and also some some expectation that they can gain this kind of tourist sector also. And okay, it is the end of my presentation and thank you very much for kindly attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Siva Khan, uh, to brief us the, about the Thailand Korea tourist exchange and also the tourist promotion activity by online or uh, platform or uh, offline platform. It's very useful information. And, and another is uh, the traveling uh, after the COVID 19. So before we move to another uh, topic we we might have to open the floor to uh, have the q and a if uh, the delegation interested on or they have any question you can ask on this floor please delegation No question. Maybe they understood anything, right? <laughs> so that's why I like to uh, move to the next topic uh, about uh, the Gorillas and measure to promote health cooperation with the Mekong region, which is uh, presented by uh, Professor Bokoyong So. Uh, she is an entomologist working and biomedicine health inequality and experience of the, this procession. She completes the, her PhD in anthropology at the Australian National University in 2014. And also uh, she had uh, the thesis first award, the Sir Lehman first prize for the most promising PhD dissertation in program in 2013. And also she had a lot of uh, public paper and article. Next, uh, I'd like to invite Professor uh, Bakoyong to present uh, the third topic. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your introduction. Um, Thank you uh, for the introduction. I have a question for the previous panel. Um, so um, just mentioned that while I share my screen, um, 
I just wonder that whether Thai government has any plan to vaccinate the Thai people who are living in the um, region that is going to be open for um, for tourism. So like the place like Phuket or Samui, they're going to see a lot of new tourists. So I just wonder that the Thai government have any going to give a priority to that region to vaccinate the people there first. So I guess that we can discuss that question at the uh, end of my presentation. It's my honor to be here with you as a presenter. And I wonder if you can see my shared screen. Okay, good. As mentioned and introduced, uh, I'm from the Department of Cultural Anthropology from Yonsei University. My name is Seo Kyung. In terms of health corporation or ASEAN expert, I am not the person. However, I am greatly honored to be here for last 10 years, I've been a universal health insuring in Thailand, and that has been my interest for study. And especially I highly, I was interested in uh, people's health in rural area in Thailand. In Korea, HIV and other AIDS related diseases or, the, or other stigmatized diseases were my study focus. As a anthropologist, I don't think I'm the person who can provide in detail measures. However, I just can, I believe that I can touch upon the health cooperation between Korea and Mekong region and how we can view this health cooperation between the two parties. So I want to uh, rather pay attention to the framework for the health cooperation. 3P are the goals of the new sovereign policy of the Republic of Korea, people, peace, and prosperity. And as an anthropologist, I firmly believe that these are great values. If you think about the human value, in terms of uh, anthropology, this has been a very important topic. So if you think about human dignity, regardless of which administration in Korea takes the office, it's an important issue that we should continue dealing with, especially when you set up the relations with the Southeast Asian countries. It is a great news that uh, we pay more attention to uh, human values, and especially when we are in a fierce competition among other countries in other regions like the US or Europe, uh, we can enlarge the scope of our cooperation between Korea and Mekong country. As an anthropologi anthropologist, human value is something very tempting and very interesting, but also very difficult topic. What does it mean by people-centered, people-oriented? Who are humans? In anthropology, it's a subject of study. There are lots and lots of people on the earth, but we do share some universal and common values while seeking diversity and unique characteristic in the same society. And that is why cultural anthropology exists. In the great pandemic of COVID-19, a lot of people are threatened by the same diseases and that's the everyday issue that we face. And it, it's inevitable that it's a global issue for all. However, we think about human species and when you are in the same challenge, the most important part is to recognize and realize that this COVID-19 patterns are revealed in a different patterns. It is not, it is an one issue, but at the same time is revealed in the different patterns. In particular, in Mekong region, uh, you are experiencing all different patterns and symptoms and uh, situations. As you can see on my slide, 
Uh, this is the data updated May 21st this year. Very new information. Mekong countries have a slightly different experiences among Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. They have very small fatal rate. In Vietnam, compared to cases per million, Vietnam has been greatly dealing with COVID-19. Korea is often uh, mentioned as an exemplary case, but I believe that Vietnam is another great example to tackle COVID-19. Thailand has been well managed, well managing uh, the outbreak of COVID-19, although recently they have more confirmed patients in places where people live together and work together. And there's a sudden uh, soaring number of uh, confirmed patients in Thailand. And interestingly, about the percentage of uh, fully vaccinated people, Cambodia already marked 8.7%, and that's almost a double compared to that of Korea. And I believe that's thanks to China's provision of a vaccine and some support. But interestingly, in Cambodia, even though the vaccinate, vaccination rate increased, they also have the fast ten trend of confirmed patients. So they are probably in dilemma whether they should ease the regulations of a disinfection in the society in Mekong area or in broader Southeast Asian area, this, give, this asks us a difficult question. First, are there any differences between these countries in terms of uh, health cooperation policies? If so, those who are vulnerable may show data that may not be reliable. Second, there are some countries sharing the borders, although they have slightly and sometimes very different patterns of the outbreak of the COVID-19. So what kind of implications and lessons we can learn from it? So what we should know more about the region is not just to review how many confirmed patients from the Mekong region, but we have to further study. For example, in Laos, they have very limited number of deaths, but in Laos, less than five years old, there are 67 children die in every 1,000 population. So they are suffering from some fatal and death rate. So if you think about some indicators, as you can see on the screen, you can't just simply compare. You have to consider a lot of context. WTO recently announced a very important index. And this is a COVID-19 global uh, mortality and excess mortality. This is the estimation. Uh, of uh, people who were assumed to be dead due to COVID-19. Maybe it's because the lack of the access to the medical service or because of the lockdown, or if you combine and include all these causes, you can imagine much more mortality number of a COVID-19 global mortality. And if we interpret this information limited to the Mekong region, we do not have a lot of uh, death, fortunately. However, if you think about the uh, uh, lack of access to the medical services, some food provision, uh, the number can go higher. And that's something that we should think of. And how do we interpret and respond to these issues? Well, there are some answers you can easily imagine. How can we protect our people from such pandemic? And what are some important 
elements. The second one's called the universal health coverage. And that is one of the most important part that we should pay attention. Who, uh, how many people can quickly recover from the pandemic? That's what it's this universal health coverage is about. If you think about some people under the universal health coverage, there's only one third of a population over the all over the world and in even in mekong region people in thailand people in cambodia people in vietnam have been under slightly different circumstances of a universal health coverage and their health cover coverage level is relatively low so within mekong re region we even have a slightly different levels than how, what kind of role can Korea play in the region. Recently, there are some interesting supporting programs related to K-quarantine under the new Southeast, uh, new sovereign policy. So the issue here is how to introduce this K quarantine model to Southeast Asian countries. And that's what I want to pay more attention while reviewing slightly different phenomena among Mekong countries and what kind of uh, approaches that we should further pay attention to. As you are well aware, K quarantine is based on 3T. 3T stands for test, treat, and trace. And here we have a goal to provide uh, standardized measures. Test, treat, and tra trace are the basic, and that's not new to anybody at all. But in Korea, Within this basic frame, we have 18 different areas as internationally standardized criteria. If you think about suggesting standards, that means you are leading the area. However, in a way, as mentioned before, at the regional level and the world's level, we have differences. In other words, the way our society oper works varies. And if that's the case, one standard, one standard may not work at the end of the day. Korea's COVID-19 experience has a very interesting element. And by reviewing this, many other countries can learn more and respond better. But in return, if we want to export the K-quarantine model, there might be some challenges I can imagine. And how can we discuss such differences among countries? This is one of the scenes that I often see in Thailand Every day, they have a government briefing with a very detailed information. Unlike Korea, they do have a Thai announcement as well as English. It's actually very hard to find the sign language translation on Thai media, but due to COVID-19, it became a norm and which was very interesting that I realized. It is something similar that we do in Korea, but some different details. And this is the area I studied for long in Chiang Mai, Thailand, and this is the uh, temporary clinic. And this is used to be a huge gymnasium, and then they converted it to as a, a treatment center. Well, in Korea, we have a goal to provide a unit for a single patient or two, but in Thailand, uh, they have more like uh, wartime treatment services because they sometimes have an enormous number of people coming into, coming into this facility. Maybe you think this doesn't look sufficient or efficient for confirmed patients. However, 
in the region, it is very encouraging that the local government quickly prepared and responded to the soaring number of the confirmed patients. And I got to learn in the course of my study in Chiang Mai that their public health system has been well established over the years. So it has been very organic and quickly responding to any kind of pandemic or outbreak of any diseases. This is one of the biggest difference between differences between Korea and Thailand because we had some issues of sharing medical information with some private clinics and the government. However, Thailand uh, utilized already existing medical facilities in order to quickly respond to the outbreak of the COVID-19. So I want to emphasize that such standardized K quarantine model could be customized and uh, reinterpreted. But to do so, we have some challenges if you want to realize that genuine customization. But here we should not give up and we should admit that this, there are some limits, but it's more important to review more of the differences and what makes such differences exist between different countries. If you see this map, you can see the map of Korea and the Mekong region. And Korea's case is very unique. Korea is somehow very small country size-wise. And we are still divided country. So in the very unique circumstances, we are already unique. We have a strong centralization of the government with some great urban development, but there are rare cases of such country, especially in Mekong regions. region, they have different circumstances. If you think about the Mekong region, uh, that area can illustrate illustrate uh, what different countries interact by sharing borders while there are big economic gaps among countries. Therefore, what I want to suggest today is not only just delivering, simply delivering K model, but customizing based on different cultural background and different social background. Rather, it's important to understand what is happening in the broader areas such as Mekong region. Instead of simply providing K quarantine model, in return, Mekong region rather can provide their experiences of a unique phenomena of each country. Uh, I should summarize what I prepared, Mekong region is very important in terms of uh, environmental crisis and that also leads to health crisis and Mekong is the region where people experience such crisis the most. As you heard very well from the keynote speech, this is not just an issue of a one region, rather it is a global issue, flood, drought, and other natural disasters can affect human economies a lot and that it, they greatly affect human lives. If you think of a Mekong region, this river should look more muddy color, but right now it's getting uh, faded and that means rivers are changing over the decades and that can greatly change the agriculture and the ecosystem and some contacts between the human and the nature and some spillover of the outbreak of the pandemic can occur further. Then what kind of role can Korea play? Maybe we can think of a new model called Mekong model.
So in summary, what I want, wanted to say is at the end of the day, people-centered. Then what does that mean? Well, interestingly, ASEAN once called its community as a caring and sharing community while understanding the diversity and the differences of uh, community members. How can we prepare for the next stage of the potential pandemics in the in the future? And one the concept called the One Health could be considered and that can apply to human and animals and any natural elements in the environment in, where we live. And sometimes you can think of some syndemics and the hidden epidemics as well as the pandemic like COVID-19, but then you here you have to review some mental health and the occupational health accordingly. And in Mekong region, you can see the great changes and where you can find great points to cooperate. So to understand Mekong region's changes, Korea can contribute to uh, new goals in Mekong River, sorry, Mekong region. So rather than K quarantine model, I want to emphasize a new concept of a Mekong uh, quarantine model. And that's what I will strive further as a scholar. And that wraps up my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Okayong, uh, for uh, your presentation on the promote health cooperation with the Mekong region, especially for the model like K quarantines and model for the Southeast Asia country. It's very useful information for the, our delegations today. So we, this is uh, the, the last topic that we have presented for in the morning. And we have the floor, we still have a time, right? for a little bit for the q and a if any uh, delegation like to uh, have some question we can open the floor for delegation please yeah, i have one question for professor sobo young sobo young gyosunim thank you very much for your presentation professor so i felt for a lot of things that you mentioned first of all you mentioned the biomedical facilities in Thailand. I That reminds me of my time in Bangkok when I worked there. Singapore and Thailand are advanced countries with uh, some medical services and medical services uh, became some sort of industry in Singapore and Thailand and sometimes if uh, when I experienced some medical services in Thailand, it was great, but that was the case in the bigger cities and major cities in Thailand. And so it was interesting because I had a hands on act, uh, experience. And you also emphasize the people centered approach. If you think of the vision of the new Southern policy of the Korean government, the concept people-centered or people-oriented Asia should be reiterated, but we need to redefine this concept. So I want to ask Professor Saul, if you mention about peace and prosperity, community with a peace and prosperity, which is people-centered, what kind of uh, what kind of forms do you believe that the community should provide as people-centered community? I want to know about that. Thank you for your question, Mr. Ambassador. As Professor Prom had a question, 
I think. Uh, I, I just want to make a, a, a little comment a little comment about the presentation because I, I, I'm listening in English, so I don't know whether I catch up Korean or not. Okay? But uh, the things I want to share is that recently, uh, as we are watching news in Thailand every every day, eh? and then we got we, we know that our case, like today, we have uh, around 3,000 3, case in the new case, right? But almost half of them is from a migrant worker, which is not Thai. You know? and and the quarantine system in Thai which is like like Kun Sivakon say that the traveler have to come here and make a quarantine for 14 days or at least seven days in now today in Phuket but it's just uh, uh, it's it's allowed it's, it's about the, the, the legal the legal travel so they come in a in a in in a, in a legal way but most of of the migrant workers is cross broadening and then it's illegal. So our second wave, uh, about two, two months, uh, two or three months ago, a few months ago, and then I think uh, uh, this wave also, this wave we have two cluster, two big cluster. One cluster is a migrant worker in the factory. So in the in one factory, in one case, I didn't, didn't I, and we cannot remember his, his the, the name, but in 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 suburban area, they have six thousand worker in, in, in the faculty. And then almost 4,000 people already infected by COVID which is in this, within the same factory. And all of them are migrant worker. Yeah. So I think the cross-boarding, the cross-boarding people is, uh, is a big problem to win all uh, in, in, in terms of the healthcare system in Southern, uh, in Mekong region. Thank you for your comments and the question. And I believe that that is in line with my story and presentation. As Professor Pram mentioned, I want to add more. If you think of the border control, it's very difficult if you are neighboring with other countries in the Mekong region and there are some uh, migrant movement between countries and how well you manage this migrant movement uh, will be the key of uh, pandemic control and that's something that Korea can Korea may not be able to help because we don't really have an experience of a neighboring border. And under, there are some immigrants and constantly moving around. And I don't want to say this is a problem. It's more like a phenomena that uh, each country need to cooperate to pay more attention to solve the problem. And I had a, I heard a great story from Thai cases, and I'm sure there are great clinics in Thailand, and I'm sure there are very good uh, profit, profitable hospitals. And probably you should go to two tracks. And in Korea, it's more like a public services, but uh, medical tourism in Thailand or some profitable hospitals are quite different in Thailand from Korean hospitals. And uh, probably we can create more room for the universal healthcare in Thailand. And if you think of the public healthcare coverage, uh, that's not something that maybe we could see in Bangkok, but Thailand does have a long history of the healthcare approach. And uh, also, we have some healthcare gap between the capital of Seoul in Korea and other remote areas and small cities. But I believe that for a very long time, Thailand has been focusing on some local and autonomous services in Thailand because I've seen at least one uh, strategic hospital uh, in different regions of Thailand. So I believe it's pretty organized and that is quite impressive. And, and regarding immigration, 
Thai government once announced an interesting plan that any immigrants and foreign residents in Thailand should be able to get vaccinated. And I heard that news before. I'm not sure about uh, res vaccine reservation rate in Thailand, and I don't know how realistically that will be carried out to give everybody vaccine, but at least Thailand, Thai government has a uh, ambitious goal to care and seek for opportunities to provide the vaccination to immigrants. And I'm sure that's an important gesture that a government can suggest. So if I move to my topic and concept of a people center to answer the question of the uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, Korea's new sovereign policy sometimes is interpreted too much in uh, focusing on people. Some people say people themselves have great value and dignity and other people think that people are resources. But what I want to highlight, the most important part of the concept of a people center is not about economic growth or uh, seeing people as tool, uh, we have to see people as it is if you want to uh, value more about the concept of uh, people-centered. And that's, I'm sure, that's also the center of uh, humanity and for, under, uh, for other purposes of economic development, we should not exploit human resources. But in ever-changing environment, it's very encouraging that the Korean government pay attention to the value and the concept called the human-centered and people-centered. Uh, if we, we often think some countries by classifying them, whether they are advanced countries or uh, emerging companies, and but what, should, what we should value more is about the happiness of our citizens and we have, where should we put more values? And I think that's how, that's one way that we can classify who are advanced countries or not. And if we can actively suggesting uh, some examples and some approaches of the concept of a people-centered, you should be able to be one of the power of the world. Okay, thank you, uh, and, uh, Professor Park Kyung and Professor Pham for the answer the question. As I see. The connection is not very good. I'd like to thank Professor Bantabong Kapilaban for moderating the session one. It was a very interesting topics. Now, the session two will begin in one and a half hours at 2.40, the afternoon session will be, we have two sessions, peace and prosperity. We have many interesting presentations waiting for the afternoon session. So please make sure that you join us again at 2.30 after enjoying your lunch. Thank you. Please enjoy your lunch and see you at 2.30. Thank you.